Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Samantha, and I will be assisting with today's session. Today's topic is Harnessing Coriolis, presented by Mr. Mick Crabtree. Mick holds a master's in industrial flow measurement and has over 30 years of experience in the field of industrial process control and instrumentation. He has spent the last 16 years running industrial workshops throughout the world and published eight technical resource books ranging from basic measurement technology to industrial data communications and field bus systems. Before we begin, I would like to point out that this webinar is being recorded and your microphones are muted, but if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the chat box and we will address them at the end. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Mick. Okay, thank you, uh, Samantha. Okay. Um, firstly, let's just start off what we're, we're looking at uh, are learning today. Um, the, uh, the first thing is that uh, the, the, the effect um, de Coriolis um, neither discovered nor invented the actual Coriolis effect, that um, the practical application of the Coriolis effect in the field of engineering has been in mass flow measurement that uh, the importance of mass flow measurement is the primary measurement, the, uh, how incremental gains have actually moved the Coriolis mass flow meter towards being the, the perfect measuring system, um, which we'll have a look at. And depending on which hemisphere you're in, whether the Coriolis effect determines direction in which the water drains out of your bathtub. So two simple questions. Now, uh, normally, these simple questions would be uh, addressed to an audience where I could see and a show of hands. So the first one would be, um, who here has ever heard of the Coriolis effect? Now, I have to be honest, when I did a recent poll, um, I got a zero answers on that. I didn't get a single reply. Um, admittedly, that was up at the rugby club on a Saturday night around about 10 o'clock. Wales had just won. So I wasn't expecting a great uh, response there. And those of you who have heard of it, who believes that dependent on which hemisphere you're in, it determines the direction which water drains out of the bathtub? Well, I can't see a show of hands, so um, it's a rhetorical question at the moment. So let's go on. Um, the Coriolis effect itself um, should really be ascribed to uh, Giovanni uh, Riccioli, uh, Riccioli um, and that was in 1651. Now that was about nine years after Galileo had just been, uh, had died um, after having been um, under house arrest for some nearly 10 years for believing that the um, world rotated. Um, so he, in 1651, he described how the rotation of the Earth should cause a cannonball fired to the north to deflect to the east. Well, there we are. Since at that time it was not observable effect, you couldn't actually see it, it was used as an argument for geocentrism, which placed the Earth at the center of our solar system. So it backed the Pope up. Um, so although the actual Coriolis acceleration equation was derived by Euler, that was um, uh, 1749, um, it was another 100 years before um, uh, Coriolis force appeared in a paper by the French scientist to which the name has been given. Rather unfairly, I think. Um, it could have been given either to uh, Riccioli or maybe um, even Euler, but there we are. So what is the Coriolis effect? Um, the major impact, if you like, um, the, if you uh, Google Coriolis effect, you probably see it. Um, it's determined in uh, meteorology um, in terms of uh, 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 wind patterns, weather patterns. Um, consequently, in the Northern Hemisphere, we, we have cyclonic rotation has an anti-clockwise direction and a um, clockwise direction in the Southern Hemisphere. But the actual practical application is in the field of mass flow. And mass flow 
um, is a primary unit, a flow measurement, is unaffected by the viscosity, by the density, the conductivity, the pressure, the temperature of the actual medium. As a result, it's inherently more accurate and meaningful for um, particularly measuring material transfer. Furthermore, um, in many industries, and we're talking most reactions are realized on a stoichiometric basis. That means that, it, that stress is a relationship with the quantities of the substances rather than the volume. Most technologies actually measure velocity. So uh, they'll measure things like meters per second or feet per second. And then they calculate the, the volumetric flow rate, which is uh, given a simple Q, um, in terms of maybe cubic meters per minute or gallons per meter or uh, minute or maybe liters per second. Um, so if we know the actual um, uh, flow rate, um, A is the cross-sectional area, then we can say that Q is equal to the velocity times the cross-sectional area. In order to determine the actual mass flow, we'd need to, in other words, we want uh, QM, often given a symbol QM, we need to know it in terms of uh, kilograms per second or pounds per second or tons per hour. We need to determine the density. So the mass flow now becomes VA Volt, the uh, velocity times the, uh, the, the cross-section area times the density. So the problem lies here is that the, uh, the mass flow is thus the, the actual volumetric times the, the density. So how do we determine density? Well, there are lots of methods, but traditionally it's always been achieved through the use of nuclear gamma ray based technology. In recent years there are other technologies, but that was the traditional method of measuring it. And uh, that was not only costly, um, uh, very expensive, but you needed licensing for it, so it, it raised a lot of problems. In contrast, the Coriolis based metering measures the mass flow directly. So let's have a look at this Coriolis effect. Um, imagine two little girls. Um, I've got Anne and I've got Linda, and they're playing on a children's roundabout. So we've got, um, and that's rotating at a constant angular velocity. We have um, Anne is sitting about midway. And we have uh, Belinda is sitting at the edge there. And if Anne now throws a ball directly at Belinda, it will actually pass behind her. And it's not because girls can't throw straight. It's because of what is termed the Coriolis effect. Why? Well, let's have a look. The fact is that while Anne and Belinda, they've both got the same angular velocity, their actual tangential velocities are totally different. In fact, Anne's tangential velocity, that's VA here, is only half of Belinda's. So, when the ball leaves Anne, it's got her tangential velocity, VA, and therefore will naturally pass behind her. Done a little bit of animation here, um, which I'm uh, very pre uh, proud of. Uh, so here we go. That's if the platform were not rotating. Please note, I got uh, 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 Anne in the center there. And, it, and, and Belinda could quite happily catch it. But if the platform is rotating, then Belinda's not where she should be. The ball has um, Anne's tangential velocity. So in order to move the ball from Anne to Belinda, uh, the actual tangential velocity has got to be accelerated. It's got to be accelerated from VA to VB. And the acceleration is the result of what is termed a Coriolis force. It's directly proportional to the product of the mass in motion, the speed, and the angular velocity of rotation. So there we are. That was the uh, formula that was derived by both Euler and Coriolis. It wasn't called the Coriolis force, of course, in those days uh, by Euler. But there we are. We have the Coriolis force. That's the tangential velocity. That's the angular velocity. And that's the mass of the ball. 
On that basis, looking at that equation, if we could measure the Coriolis force and we're knowing the tangential velocity and the angular velocity, guess what? We could determine the mass of the ball. Rather convoluted way of doing it, but now I want you to imagine a liquid filled pipe. There it is, liquid filled pipe, it's sealed at both ends and it's rotating about an axis at an angular velocity um, omega again. The tangential velocity of any individual particle is simply the angular velocity omega times the distance from the center of rotation. So there we are, we have a particle there and its um, tangential velocity is given by r1 omega. V1. And a particle there would have R2 omega, and that would determine the angular, the tangential velocity V2. But now, what happens if we got a fluid flow? What happens if we got a flow through the pipe like this? That means we have particles moving, and then any individual particle would move from a distance R1 through to R2, and somehow its tangential velocity must increase. It has to increase from V1 to V2. In order to accelerate the particle, um, we need a force, and that force is the Coriolis force, and will be actually felt as opposing the pipe's direction of rotation. In other words, it'll try to slow down the rotation of the pipe. Consequently, the torque we try to rotate the pipe will increase in direct proportion to the actual mass flow of the liquid. Okay, a direct application is actually to be found in the radial vein type meter, which was devised in the sort of uh, 50s, as we'll see. So here it is, this was a radial vein Coriolis meter. Um, it actually comprised a rotating system, which was a, uh, a centrifugal pump type impeller, and it was driven at a constant speed by this motor. And it was driven at a constant angular velocity omega. Now, as the liquid enters this, it's going to be accelerated from the center through to the outside and I will therefore undergo Coriolis acceleration or uh, forces will be uh, generated due to Coriolis force, Coriolis effect. And this, as the tangential velocity increases, it reacts on the impeller with a force directly proportional to the mass flow rate. Okay, Coriolis force is measured by a torque tube. Um, now, we could measure that, uh, the torque measurement with, could be done by strain gauges or by um, um, other uh, devices, but whatever is going to be measuring it, we've got certain problems. One of them is maintaining the motor speed to provide a constant angular velocity. Number two, we need slip rings for power and the measurement of the torque. And um, we've got a high unrecoverable pressure loss, and oh, we've got wear and tear. So let's have a look. And um, this comes from um, uh, uh, Edward Jenks, um, a, a Kroner, who kindly allowed me to make use of this uh, chart. And he'd plotted, this was applying the uh, uh, Coriolis effect to measure mass flow rate recognized years ago. And these were the patents registered in the 1950s. So initial concepts were um, fairly low, as we can see, but we can see we, we started in about 1952. And these were patents applied to uh, mass flow rate, trying to use the Coriolis effect. Of significance, and I will talk about this in a moment, I don't normally like talking about companies, but the, uh, the very first I would say successful application um, was, was Micromotion. That was founded in 1977. We then had quite a um, early commercialization, so we had quite an increase, sudden increase in the number of patents. Um, subsequently, we've had 
Well, we can see what's happened in um, the optimization, digitization. It's been a huge increase, as we can see, from the 50s through to um, our present day here. Um, the micromotion um, and what um, uh, they actually, uh, if we go back a moment, whoop, sorry, wrong way. What uh, um, uh, what they actually found it was bent, and I want you to look at this. I want you to imagine we've got a a tube that's bent like this, and it's actually rotating. It's rotating around this axis. So as fluid actually enters the tube, here we are. The it moves from A with a tangential velocity of zero to B with a tangential velocity as to the maximum. As the tangential velocity increases, the Coriolis forces acting on the pipework create a twisting motion. So we're actually going to get distortion of the pipe. Subsequently, as the fluid moves from C with a tangential velocity to the maximum to D with a tangential velocity of zero. Again, Coriolis forces acting on the pipework create a twisting motion, but in the opposite direction. So, with no flow, a dual rotating system would appear something like this. That's with no flow. But with flow, it would look something like this. There would be distortion of the pipework. Let's have a look at a more practical system um, where we don't rotate the pipe, we merely move it. We move it up and down, simple harmonic motion. In practice, we vibrate it to create this harmonic motion. No fluid, motion is just in one plane, as we can see here. However, with fluid flow, the Coriolis forces acting on the tube again produce a twisting motion. And the twisting motion is directly proportional to the mass flow of the fluid. <coughs> Measuring the degree of twist, that's the distortion, is accomplished through velocity sensors. So we have a velocity sensor placed at strategic points here and there. And in this basis, with no fluid flow, that's no twisting distortion, the sinusoidal outputs of the two velocity sensors would be in phase, like that. But if we get a twisting motion, so there'd be no time difference between them. But if we get, with fluid flow, the twisting motion of the pipe, that produces a phase difference, which is directly proportional to the mass flow. So if we could measure that phase difference, that phase difference is directly proportional to the mass flow. Due to its symmetrical design, the beauty of this, it performs equally well with reverse flow. It's truly uh, bidirectional. And again, we're measuring the phase difference. So I talked about micromotion and the actual inventor, Jim Smith, uh, patented the first practical system in 1977 when he founded micromotion. And this was the um, original concept. And we can see here that the uh, fluid actually enters at this point here and is divided into two equal paths. It then flows through these two tubes and exits at this point there. We have a drive coil at this point there which um, uh, drives the two coils in opposition to each other. And we have uh, a velocity detector um, on either side of the two tubes to measure the phase. That was it, um, a very simple application, which everyone else has uh, basically mm, copied. Well, 
Um, yes, I suppose in a way they have. So, again, with no flow, a dual vibrating system would appear like something like this. And with flow, something like that. So all we've got to do is measure the distortion. Now, in order to reduce the risk of stress fractures, the, the actual osses, the amplitude is, is limited to about, is less than one millimeter. In fact, it can be as small as 0.1 millimeter. So we're not talking about uh, the, the whole thing shaking and vibrating all over the place. We're talking about very small amounts of vibration. In an optimally designed system, this would be about 20% of the permitted uh, maximum value. You don't want to start creating stress fractures. Um, and the, the actual distortion caused by the Coriolis force is about 100 times smaller. So we're looking at a magnitude of about 10 microns or micrometers. Um, but we're not actually measuring amplitude. We're measuring phase difference. We're measuring time. But even so, we're looking at measurement resolution of 0.1% amounts to only a few nanoseconds. And in order to achieve an accuracy of the order of 0.1%, we need a resolution to be typically five, ten times higher. So you're looking at a, a time shift difference measurement down to 100 picoseconds. Now, just remember, a picosecond, we're talking about a million millionth of a second. So we are talking about very, very, very small time differences indeed. What about density measurement? Well, let's just have a look at this. The whole point to remember is that the actual measurement I've talked about, mass flow, is um, irrespective it's not determined by, uh, uh, it's a direct measurement itself. But let's think about this. If I look at Hooke's law very briefly, um, Hooke's law spring equation states a mass suspended on a spring, loss later resonant frequency, which is given by um, basically uh, uh, 1 upon 2 pi k upon m. Don't want to worry about that too much. That's the resonant frequency. That's the spring constant. Um, that is the mass. It shows that when a mass increases, the natural frequency decreases, and or vice versa. We have a, a vibrating tube system. And the natural vibration frequency of the tubes is going to be determined by their stiffness and mass. Since the volume in the tubes is constant, any change in the fluid density is actually going to cause a change in the mass within the tubes, which changes the natural resonant frequency. The density of the fluid, again, is inversely proportional to the square of the resonant frequency. So there's a direct inverse proportionality here. Consequently, by tracking the actual resonant oscillation frequency, we can calculate the fluid's density. And I want you to important to recognize that the, this density measurement is not based on the Coriolis effect. Um, it's actually based on the effect of a vibrating tube. And in fact, there are now on the market quite a few vibrating tube-based, uh, vibrating tube type uh, uh, density measuring devices. So, although the natural frequency is directly related to the uh, fluid density, we also need compensation for the slight change in tube stiffness. This is due to Young's, Young's modulus that occurs with temperature. So again, um, a temperature is also got to be measured as an independent quantity and used as a compensating variable and is available as a measured output. So if we've now knowledge of both the mass flow and the density of the fluid, it's now possible to also cal calculate the volumetric flow. Um, I've had people say, well, I would not use a Coriolis meter because I don't want, um, I don't want the uh, mass flow. I want the actual volumetric flow. Well, it's simple. 
helpful um, because we know the density, we know the, uh, the mass flow, we can therefore calculate volumetric flow directly since Q is equal to QM, that's the mass flow divided by the density. Um, the ensuring that the tubes are driven um, at their resonant frequency, it's a simple feedback system um, from the pickup coils. The pickup coils are used um, to drive the uh, tube drive. This is a feedback system. So excitation uh, requires less uh, drive energy and ensures excitation is in the primary measurement measure resonant mode at all times. Right. We had over the years many, many tube configurations. Um, in any arrangement uh, requiring the tube to be bent, the outside wall is going to be stretched and thus becomes thinner. Whilst the inner walls become thicker. And when the flow meters requires two such convoluted tubes, it becomes difficult to balance them both dimensionally and dynamically. Furthermore, if the liquid is abrasive, this is already weakened, part of the flow meter is likely to be the most severely stressed. So abrasive material can also cause erosion, will change the stiffness of the resonant elements, and so cause measurement errors. So what sort of arrangement could we have? Well, a uh, very popular one at first was the one I showed you, which was the parallel arrangement. Um, this got a high total cross-sectional area, but with the flexibility of the two pipes. Um, high pressure drop due to the flow divider. Um, the other problem is that the flow may not be equally divided. How would we know? Um, and we cannot have uh, CIP clean in place. You couldn't run a bung through it or a, um, a, a, a pig through this. So um, there in the food, in, um, food industry, um, food and beverage industry, where Coriolis is frequently used, I can assure you, um, this would not be ideal. Um, so another method was derived, which was a serial arrangement, which was a continuous loop. That allows for uh, a clean in place. Um, Downside has got a larger cross-sectional area required to reduce the pressure loss. This leads to increasing rigidity, and that makes it less sensitive at low flow rates. Basic advantage, lower pressure drops, since there's no splitter, but it's got a higher pressure drop due to the longer length of the pipe. Um, but there's also increased rigidity for the same cross-sectional area. And then a whole host of other designs um, appeared on the market, um, all seeking to find a balance between sensitivity, between pressure drop and self-draining. Because again, in many industries, uh, self-draining becomes uh, quite an important criterion. And then, next major milestone was, and I have to talk about a company here, Anderson Hauser, because they introduced their first ever straight tube design in 1986. Um, basically, the idea here is with no flow, flexion of the tube takes in the vibrational plane, as we can see here. However, in the event of fluid flow, the Coriolis forces acting on the sensors uh, produce a distorted flexure, which is detected by the sensors. We can see here this is the distorted flexure. Um, that occurs. Um, different designs, I'll just mention a couple of, uh, of um, uh, metering systems here. Uh, one comes out of um, uh, Yokogawa, um, uh, dual bent measuring tubes, 0.1% accuracy. Um, Micromotions Elite um, have uh, up to 10 inches. Uh, 0.05 accuracy for liquid and 0.35% for gases. This is unprecedented. This is unbelievable. Nominal resolution program for 10,000 pulses per barrel, for example. Um, 
This comes out of a company, a German company, Rionic. Um, it's a 12-inch Coriolis meter. It's the world's largest bent tube. It's um, a two six-inch measuring tubes. You can see them here. Um, it's got a 0.2% accuracy. Um, uh, next one up was, came out of um, uh, Anderson Hauser. That's a 14-inch uh, bent tube Coriolis meter. It was the world's second largest. Um, again, 0.05% accuracy for liquids and 0.35% for gases. And right this moment, um, we have the world's largest uh, straight tube meter, um, in fact, the world's largest um, Coriolis meter, which come, um, that was released uh, uh, in sort of, I think, October last year um, from Krona. Um, and again, flow rates up to 4,600 kilograms per hour, um, 500 uh, to 1 turndown ratio. 0.05 accuracy for liquid, 0.35% for gases, which seems to be the, uh, the standard at the moment for uh, custody transfer Coriolis meters. Not forgetting that um, this is a compact density meter, which is based on just measuring uh, 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 density. Uh, and it's based not on the Coriolis effect, it's based on vibrating tube effect, um, which a lot of people confuse with being Coriolis. Um, and that gives me accuracy down to 0 0.0001 grams per cubic centimeter, or if you like, is the equivalent to 0 0.05 API. So where to next? Well, at the other extreme, we have a growing demand for microdosing, and that's in areas uh, pharmaceuticals, um, in silicon fabrication, laboratory sample analyzing, processing, and they require measuring rates incredibly small, down to one gram per hour and even lower. And they've been met by what we call MEMS-based technologies, microelectromechanical systems, in which the entire mechanical Coriolis fluid system is integrated into a single silicon microchip. And there it is. Now, some designs have focused on very low flow rates. That's down to 10 milligrams per hour or even better whilst the other designs be mainly designed to develop gas density and concentration. The advantage using silicon is that it be, never deforms. It is virtually free of fatigue, hysteresis, and drift. And another benefit is that the actual resonant frequency is very high, typically of the order of about 20 kilohertz, and that makes it virtually impervious to any form of extraneous vibration. Uh, we'll come on to that one in a moment uh, because this is an area of concern. I'm not saying it's a problem. I'm saying it's an area of concern. A third advantage of silicon over steel is that its density is um, 3.4 times lower. So while conventional Coriolis meters um, are typically not sensitive enough to accurately measure gas density at very low pressures, a significantly higher sensitivity can result from the use of silicon. So what are the issues? Well, in the time available, I can't talk all over them. But let's just have a look at a couple. Um, one of the challenges has been in the custody transfer of LNG. Now, this requires the system to be capable of operating down to uh, minus 165 degrees Celsius, and that poses a severe challenge in terms of material embrittlement, in terms of uh, seals, in terms of, um, of many, many things. Um, can I use a bent tube? Well, one of the problems with uh, bent tubes is the possibility of flashing, um, as we're, particularly at those low temperatures. But in reality, uh, has been met and overcome, and 
uh, Coriolis meeting for LNG is starting to become standard practice. Um, another problem was being in the design um, uh, of what we call the liquid to gas ratio. And in earlier designs, this was confined to between 4 and 6%. In other words, you could not have um, a, a, a gas, entrained gas is higher than about uh, 6%. This, in recent years, again, newer models employing a number of really innovative designs maintain active measurement in all measuring conditions with gas content ranging from as low as zero right up to 100% by volume. Um, this is quite revolutionary, um, uh, devised by uh, a couple of companies, uh, which uh, uh, have, uh, are, are, are really cashing in on this or trying to. It has to be recognized that um, this technology is being leapfrogged by, um, uh, I would say, the three main contenders at the moment, which are um, uh, Micromotion, that's from Emerson, Anderson Hauser, and Kroner. And um, whilst I mentioned Kroner have the, the largest um, system at the moment, the 16-inch, um, uh, last year it was Anderson Hauser with 14-inch. How much further this is going, who knows? What features, um, we now need to look, what features would actually make the perfect flow meter? Um, maybe I've left a couple of things out, but let's have a look at them. We'd like direct measurement of mass flow and volumetric flow. We'd like high accuracy, and we'd like at least 0.1%. We want high temperature range. We need it ranging from minus 200 right up to uh, plus 400, ideally. High pressure range up to 400 bar. We'd like a high turndown ratio, at least 20 to 1. We'd like bidirectional flow measurement. We'd like it to be independent of density changes, independent of flow profile and the flow uh, turbulence. We'd like no routine maintenance required. We'd like never drifts or wears, never needs zeroing. We'd like zero pressure drop. We like advanced diagnostics. We like to be accepted by governing and legal bodies in all the industries. And we like um, sizes up to, um, yeah, let's, yeah, a nominal one meter, one meter pipe diameter. Uh, that's what we like, 36 inch uh, pipe. That would be great. Um, and we'd like it to be inexpensive. So most, not all, of these requirements are actually met in the Coriolis meter. We have direct measurement of mass flow. Yep, absolutely. High accuracy, at least 0.1%. Yes, we have that. Uh, high temperature range. Yes, we've got that. High pressure range. Yes, we've got that. High turn down. Absolutely. I mentioned uh, the, uh, the Krona one, 500 to one. Bidirectional flow measurement, definitely. Independent of density changes, flow profile, and flow turbulence, definitely. No routine maintenance required. Never drifts or wears and needs zeroing. Well, um, there is a factor. We do need um, it to be zeroed uh, with no flow. But drifts or wears, shouldn't drift, shouldn't wear. Uh, zero pressure drop, absolutely. Um, advanced diagnostics. Definitely, accepted by governing legal bodies in all industries, definitely. And sizes up to 100 millimeter pipe diameter, well, not yet. Um, we've got it up to 16 inches. How much further are we going to go? And inexpensive. Maybe we have a big turn down uh, face on that one. So although it is doubtful that there will ever be a one size fits all, Plumbing that's based on the Coriolis effect provides an almost universal range of answers. It's got direct inline accurate measurement of both liquids and gases. Accuracy is as high as 0 0.05 for liquids and 0.35 for gases. We've got mass flow measurement, ranges covering from less than 5 grams a minute to more than 1,600 tons an hour. 
We've got density measurement down to as little as 0 0.0005 grams per cubic uh, centimeter. Um, the measurement is independent of temperature, pressure, viscosity, conductivity, density of the medium. Mass flow, density, and temperature can be accessed from one sensor and can be used for most applications irrespective of the density of the process. So it can be used on uh, printer zinc, peanut butter. That was my first actual application many, many years ago. Um, it can be used on soup. It can be used on slurries. Um, what are the areas of concern? There have been areas of concern in the past that some models have been affected by vibration, external vibration in the pipe. Um, this can be overcome. Um, and a lot of models, or no, let me rephrase that. There are models on the market available that are not affected by external uh, vibration. Um, generally, at the moment, limited pipeline diameters of uh, 400 millimeters, 16 inch. Secondary containment problems may be an area of concern. Um, if I did perhaps chance have secondary um, uh, containment that wasn't uh, uh, to the maximum, I'm not particularly sure I want to be sprayed with raw sulfuric acid as I'm passing underneath um, due to stress fractures. Uh, generally limited to medium temperatures of 430 degrees C. Is that a problem? Um, and it's expensive. Now, a couple of uh, comments. Um, this was an, an article um, from um, Eric Heivel, Heilville of Siemens. And he actually stated, the first barrier to Coriolis world domination can be summed up in a single word, price. A one-inch line magnetic flow meter and transmitter, for example, can be had for about $3,000 or less. A comparable size Coriolis meter can run upwards of 9,000 or more. Nonetheless, we had a specialist from the same company who wrote the following. Budget Coriolis sensors offer flow accuracies of between 0.2 to 0.75 percent of rate, and this specification remains stable over the life of the meter, which can actually span 10, 20 years. Compare that to a foundation meter that starts at 1 percent, um, and I think by foundation meter he probably talking about some form of head loss, um, like an orifice plate start at 1% of rate accuracy and varies significantly over time. In many cases, low-cost Coriolis sensors provide a return on investment less than one year. So we should not actually be looking at the initial capital cost. We should be looking at what, what is the ROI, um, particularly over um, uh, short periods of time. Um, in terms of price, I'd rather recall the words of uh, John Ruskin, who basically said, there's hardly anything in the world that some man cannot make a little worse and sell a little cheaper. And the people who consider price only are the, this man's lawful prey. And I think we should remind our buying departments of this little uh, 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 phrase. So, I think we've... Repeating myself there, let's go on to the next one. And that's the final burning question. That's the one on everyone's lips. Depending on which hemisphere you're in, does the Coriolis effect determine the direction in which water drains out of a bathtub? Um, you'll see, if you go on to uh, YouTube, you'll see uh, um, I think it was in uh, Kenya, uh, where guys are pouring water into a bucket, and we can see it swirling on one side of the equator, and then they move the bucket over a, an Im imaginary line, and it goes out the other way. Well, let's have a look at the reality. Theoretically, if you had a specially prepared bathtub, the answer would be yes. However, practically the answer is no. 
Such factors as any smaller symmetry in the shape of the drain will determine which direction the circulation occurs. It's also impossible to fill the tub full of water without imparting some average net motion. Such residual currents can take more than a day to subside. All these extraneous effects, influences, even including air currents, are more than enough to swamp the Coriolis effect. So the burning question, the answer is basically no. OK, um, it's time for any Q&A. All right, as we start this Q&A section, if you have any questions, please just go ahead and type them into the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, uh, my name is David. Uh, based on the explanations you have given, uh, is there any particular reason why uh, Coriolis meter is not being discussed for multi-phase flow measurement? For multi-phase measurement. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, the, uh, it depends what you call multi-phase, um, because I, I haven't enlarged on it in this particular, uh, uh, because I've only got 45 minutes, I could spend a day on it, um, but I did mention entrained gas. So um, if you're talking about dual phase, that's um, uh, uh, gas, and, um, and uh, liquid, uh, the problem is solved. Um, there is no problem whatsoever there. If you want more information, uh, please let me know, and I can get you more information on, on that subject. Uh, there are uh, several articles. There are several articles available, I think, from ABB, from Krona, um, who all discuss uh, this, uh, this whole problem. Uh, when we talk about multi-phase, of course, in the, the oil and gas industry, we're talking about um, often um, oil, water, and gas, and I'm not sure that that's going to be solved with, uh, with uh, um, Coriolis yet. Oh, OK, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, but uh, like you said, I would Good. like to have more information on what is available. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, no, no, uh, uh, please, please contact me, um, uh, uh, leave your details and we can get some information to you. That's all right, thank you. All right, I have another question for you. Yeah. It reads, what causes the limitations on pipe diameter for Coriolis meters? Um, basically, the limitation at the moment is in terms of the stiffness of the actual tubing arrangement. Um, I've got to be able to vibrate it, um, but at the same time, I've got to be able to pick up distortion because I'm actually distorting the pipe. So at the moment, um, that is the limitation. How thin can I make the pipe uh, pipe work? Um, and I'm not sure we're going to go that much further. We'll probably uh, uh, probably go up to 20 inches. I, uh, but there, you know what? When uh, we were looking at pipe diameters of, um, of, of six inches, I honestly didn't think it was going to go much further. And that was not that many years ago. Um, and here we are up to 16 inches. So um, who knows? Uh, the, the, as I mentioned before, the technologies are leapfrogging each other, um, and uh, the companies are leapfrogging each other on a regular basis. But at the moment, that is the main limitation. It's the, it's the actual uh, stiffness of the pipework. All right, thanks, Mick. Here's okay. another one for you. How is calibration typically conducted in the pipeline industry? Um, calibration is um, the, <laughs> a, a good point. It requires a zero calibration. That means with no flow, the, the system has got to be zeroed. Um, however, once that's done, uh, calibration is going to be conducted um, on site, sorry, when I say so, by the factory. Calibration is conducted by the factory. Um, I have seen a couple of the calibration rigs 
uh, that are used here in the UK um, and in Holland. And they, for Coriolis metering, they are extremely large, extremely expensive calibration rigs. But the beauty of it um, is that theoretically, once calibrated, it should never drift. What's going to drift? Um, and that is the burning question of the moment. Um, theoretically, it should not drift. Modern diagnostics um, uh, can analyze if things go wrong, if one of the sensors go down, if there's a blocked tube, if there are uh, problems. But the actual uh, measurement, we're measuring phase, what can go wrong. And uh, this has been um, uh, uh, subject to uh, a lot of conjecture. But at the moment, um, the beauty about the Coriolis meter that once calibrated, it will not or should not drift. Now, I say should not. Um, uh, the, the manufacturer is obviously saying will not drift. Um, but again, subject to uh, uh, conjecture. But at the moment, um, experience shows that they do not drift over time. So they're calibrated at the uh, um, calibrated by the manufacturer in uh, before being dispatched, and there is no reason why they should drift whatsoever. If um, there is a problem, diagnostics should reveal that problem. Kind of a follow-up question to that. He says, does that mean provers are no longer used for custody transfer? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, let's put it this way. Um, theoretically, the um, what we call the uh, compact uh, provers, the bore provers, are probably on their way out. There's a lot of a uh, lot of work being done on the use of both Coriolis and ultrasonic in uh, as what we call master meters. In other words, actually replacing uh, provers. So, in fact, both both these uh, technologies are being used in certain parts of the world as uh, provers in their own right. So, yes. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't throw your th provers away just yet, but um, I think they have um, a limited uh, a limited life um, in terms of technology. Thanks, Mick. Um, here is another one for you. Are all Coriolis meters bidirectional? Well, um, I, I can't answer that question, uh, but they should be. <laughs> Uh, um, I can't say that all are bidirectional because I don't know all of them. But uh, the ones I am familiar with, um, they are generally bidirectional. It's a bidirectional technology. OK, we just had one more come in. Yep. It reads, the service which I use, these meters typically, has a high amount of entrained gas. Additionally, any pressure drop typically causes gas breakout. Is this a suitable application? According to what I've uh, read, um, yes. Um, if you're going to get gas breakout, gas breakout would normally occur, um, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, as a result, possibly of bends in the tube. In a straight tube design, um, uh, the, the, the uh, five tube, de sorry, not the five tube, the four tube design um, that are coming out, the two tube design, straight tube designs, uh, there's no reason why there should be gas, gas breakout um, as a result of the actual measuring device itself. All right, if anyone has any last minute questions, now's the time. Otherwise, if you want, if you want to have a think about it, you want to send in any uh, questions, uh, please type them in, and I will answer them over the next couple of days.
All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you have any further questions, please just feel free to reach out, and I'll pass them along to Nick. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Okay, anyway, thank you for the questions, everyone. Thank you very much.